thank you for downloading our podcast. Daniel is a book that is given to us in a time when Judah's history is less than stellar. They are carried off into a foreign land. They have turned from our God. And now the Lord hands them over to the nation of Babylon. Is the Lord sovereign enough and strong enough to preserve his people? Is the Lord able to overpower this mighty world ruler, Nebuchadnezzar? Is Nebuchadnezzar the king who is able to do what his predecessors could not? Build a prestigious tower, so great and so strong, that he could penetrate the very fortress of heaven? If you are curious about these questions, please stay tuned as we work through the book of Daniel. As we survey scripture, we see that the battle between Satan and God is something that has been waged for quite a while, something where Satan always desires to overpower God, desires to desecrate the holy garden of God by whispering words contrary to the word of the Lord, holding out a false promise that Adam and Eve uh, are deceived and concede and fall into sin. We think about Job and how the Lord calls uh, the sons of gods before him or the angels and, and all these beings before him and Satan appears and gives an account. And as Satan gives an account, Satan calls to the Lord's att- or the Lord calls to Satan's attention his servant Job. Satan accuses God by saying Job only loves you because of all the great things you've done for him. We think of Christ in the wilderness in the same scenario and how Satan desires to tempt Christ to question the goodness of God's promise, the goodness of his word. So we find the same thing happening here in the book of Daniel. And it's set up in a scenario and in a scene as we begin in chapter 1, which leaves us to wonder, has God forfeited his promise? His people are exiled. Jerusalem has been toppled. The king of Judah is carried off in captivity. And there's a world leader who, by and large, is setting up this satanic paradise in Babylon. And and we wonder, is God able to overcome in this scenario? Is God sovereign? Is God able to overpower this great king who rules the world? We know a pharaoh. But is there finally one who has set up the satanic paradise and has defeated the great king of heaven? Well, as we ask that question, I think it's important to understand this paradigm with the two kings. And so we begin with a king's view as uh, we look at this from the view of Nebuchadnezzar and how it appears uh, to our fallen eyes, to our human eyes. We see Daniel's view, where we're reminded of who the Lord is and the identity of this man and wonder, can the Lord uphold this, this man? Is this man going to remember his God? And lastly, we leave with the consolation of the king's view of understanding who is the true king over all. And so let's begin with the king's view. As we notice in the setting of this book that we have the reign of Jehoiakim, Uh, 2 Kings 23, we read of him being the king of Judah. Uh, We have Nebuchadnezzar, the king who's a ruler of the foreign nation, as I've mentioned. Uh, Very much one who's setting up a rival kingdom to the kingdom of God. Uh, Babylon, a a place that we could almost say is a satanic paradise of celebrating the superiority of this place over the God of Israel. And this becomes uh, something that's even more clear when we understand that we have the king coming to Jerusalem and he besieges it. He takes uh, things from the holy city of God. And we may say, well, why is that so important? Well, think about the significance of Jerusalem. Psalm 48, David invites us to, to survey and to wander around the heavenly city. It's a wonderful picture of thinking about us even entering into heaven and thinking about just marveling at God's creative glory and and, and where he brings us, that Jerusalem reflects us. And when we have in Psalm 48, it's the city of God. God dwells in the midst of his people, Psalm 48, 1. It's a fortress, Psalm 48, 2. We have a reminder, it's a city that's established forever and makes foreign kings panic. Psalm 48, 4 through 8, the city 
that we are invited to survey for its beauty, marveling at God and his handiwork, not looking at the city itself, the, the creation, but marveling at the creator and the king who has built this place. And as you read that and you think of Psalm 48, and then you read that this holy city that's supposed to be a fortress is toppled. This other king has come in. He's taken it. He's carried off the holy things of God. And as he's carried off the holy things of God, he's placed them in his own temple, which again, what is uh, this communicating to us? It's communicating to us that Nebuchadnezzar has conquered the true God of Scripture. He has carried off the holy things of the temple and given them to his gods, celebrating that his gods are stronger than the God of heaven. So the intention is as you read this, you think, my goodness, where is our Lord? What is happening? But it gets even worse, that we find Babylon being in the plains of Shinar. We know this place, as this has been mentioned to us before in Scripture. We think of Genesis 11, verse 2. The people are those who make the Tower of Babel. And this is a place where it's going to be the gateway of gods. And we're going to build this great tower. And it's going to pierce into heaven. And they're going to be able to take the God of heaven down and basically put him on a leash and make him serve their purpose. Well, ironically, in Genesis 11, the Lord gives them exactly what they want. He comes down the tower, but it's not because it's so magnificent. The picture there is almost anthropomorphic language, you know, applying the language of man to God. It's as if God is squinting, wondering what this, this thing is that all these busybodies are doing, like a bunch of busy ants down on this earth. And he comes down and surveys it and merely gives a command. And he commands that their language be confused, and boom, this great endeavor is halted. So you're reminded, yes, there is this place, the plains of Shinar. We think about the Tower of Babel. But we also understand that our Lord halted them from making this great gate of the gods and, and entering and piercing into the heavenly fortress that God himself has established, that he defends, and he is fully capable of defending. But Babylon is a city. The city, that means gate of God. And we may wonder now, is it possible that Nebuchadnezzar, this king, has actually accomplished the ideal of what Babel was trying to do? Has he captured our God? Has he taken the Lord's people? The God's people are transferred to this city and moved. And as they are moved, we think about the holy fortress of God that has crumbled. We think about the testimony of Jehoiakim, that he is one who has done evil in the sight of God. And we think what has come of God's promise. The Lord swore to Abraham in Genesis 15. He would be a shield and defender of his people. And so now we're left with this question. Because again, when you put this in the context of the ancient Near East, what is their mindset? Their mindset is God is only strongest in the context of his temple. So if you go away from the temple, God's not going to be strong there, right? And, and all of us can fall into this and think, well, you know, maybe God's not sovereign in these circumstances. Maybe God's not really ruling over all things. And this is what I love about Daniel. It's inviting us to ask this question, is God really sovereign? And the Lord here is he has placed his people in this foreign land. As they're going to struggle, is God still strong in Babylon? Can he overpower this great king, Nebuchadnezzar? Is God stronger than this man? We find that Nebuchadnezzar himself, as he takes the holy things and places them in the temple, that this man is one who has not only triumphed over uh, Jehoiakim, the one who is summarized as doing evil in the sight of God, 2 Kings 23, 37, carried off. But we find that now this king is trying to do something consciously to the people. That Jeremiah himself even speaks of this king, Nebuchadnezzar, as his name is mentioned. Jeremiah tells us in 27 verse 6 that all the powers of the lands are given to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. We wonder, is it true? Has God forfeited his reign? Has he forsaken his people? We find that this man, Nebuchadnezzar, is going to train these Israelites, pull the prime of the people, if you will, from the Lord's people. And he's going to train these people in all the ways of the Chaldeans or the Babylonians, their religion or philosophy, all their thinking. And so the purpose of this 
is not just to give them an education, is to actually move them from their Jewish identity, their Jewish culture, as Nebuchadnezzar is no doubt showing an inferior God, at least from Nebuchadnezzar's point of view, to teach them the superior gods who have conquered the God of Israel. So we wonder, is he going to be successful? So we have these four men. As Nebuchadnezzar charges the chief eunuch, who's most likely the manager of the palace, taking care of all these duties, we have these four youths who are mentioned, who have Hebrew names. Daniel, a name that means God is my judge. Right here we're asking that question. Is, is he going to live up to this name? We have Hananiah, the grace or the Lord is gracious is a way of understanding this name. We have Mishael, who is what God is. What, what a wonderful name. It's, again, that, that name that invites us to contemplate who God is and his sovereignty and, and his attributes and his greatness and, and his majesty. That's what the name is inviting us to do. Again, we say, well, are, are we going to see if Nebuchadnezzar is what God is? And then we have Azariah, the Lord is my helper. So these names are names that communicate their Jewish identity, their tie to the true God of Scripture. And, and we wonder, is God able to, to really uh, sustain these names, sustain these men and who they are? Well, we know that Nebuchadnezzar, being a wise diplomat, a wise king, who is ruler of the nations, if you will, he knows that you have to rip these men out of their identity. So he changes their names, takes away their Jewish identity, and tries to make them of a Chaldean or Babylonian identity. And so he changes Daniel, God is my judge, to Beltus Shazar, which is basically a Mesopotamian goddess, which means protect the king. So now, instead of God being my judge, now he moves to may, may the gods of Babylon, if you will, protect Nebuchadnezzar. So it's trying to rip his identity from the true God of scripture. Shadrach, uh, Aku's command, uh, is basically what his name is changed to, uh, the moon god. Uh, so basically he's the one who does the moon god's will. Changed from Hananiah, the Lord is gracious, commemorating how the Lord deals with his people. You have Meshach, another name. We don't know exactly what it means, but it's something along the lines of who is Aku. So you have this change from who is like God or who is what God is to who is like a coup. So you can understand that transfer there. We're moving from contemplating the goodness of the true God to now who is like this false God. We go on then to Abednego, servant of Nebo. Again, a Babylonian God change from the Lord is my helper. So this one now moves from the Lord is the one who rules to now I am the one who is a servant of Nebo, is the intended identity. And so when you hear this, you say, my goodness, what is going on to, with God's people? This, this foreign ruler has captured them. He rules the world. God has promised to be a shield and defender for his people. And, and so far up to this point, it seems that he's rather silent. But now we're, we're brought into the narrative. And, and we're brought in to see closer the scene, not just from a distance, but to actually start hearing the characters interact by the inspiration of God. And we have Daniel's view in verses 8 through 16, that here we have this glorious conjunction. It's not and Daniel, meaning that he's conceding what the king is saying. But notice that it's not and Belshazzar, you know, the, the one who's really uh, protecting and celebrating the protection of Nebuchadnezzar. No, it's but Daniel. In other words, there is no concession to what Nebuchadnezzar is saying. This is intended to assure us. I was reading verses 1 through 7 saying, my, my goodness, I, I wonder what God's doing. Right here in verse 8, it's as if uh, Daniel, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is saying, but wait, reader. Don't worry. God has not forsaken his promise. God is able to protect. He's bigger than Jerusalem, bigger than the temple. And so now we have but Daniel. God is still his judge. He still follows the true God of scripture. And he is one who desires not to defile himself with the king's food. Now there's a lot of debate as to what this means. Basically, there's three ways to take this. On the one hand, it could mean that all the king's food would go through uh, the 
the temple worship or the false gods by the false priests. And so Daniel doesn't want to defile himself by participating in the food that's offered to a false god. Possible. Another way of taking this is that they're offering pork or maybe the blood's not completely drained out of the animal. Uh, so it's not prepared properly as God would desire the animal to be prepared. It's also possible. Another view that I hold to is something bigger. That what the king wants is he wants these men to have fellowship at his table. Because not all the food that was offered to the king in Babylon necessarily went through the temple. So it's probably not food that's offered to a foreign god. Uh, the food can be prepared in different ways. So there could potentially be different meat that Daniel could eat. That's not the point. The point is the king wants these men to dine at his table. He's trying to break these men. He wants these men to say, oh, look at the goodness of Babylon. It's almost like Satan with Christ. What kind of father is this? And here you are starving. Come on, just make some bread out of these rocks. You can do that. What kind of God is this? What kind of father do you serve? That's the sort of thing that's going on here. Nebuchadnezzar is saying, look, look how good I treat you. I carry you off. I defeat your God. I'm a great king. I'm benevolent. Come, eat my food. Live as a king. Enjoy the blessings of the palace. Well, Daniel's saying, we're not going to do this. We don't bow to Nebuchadnezzar. He is not our God. I am not going to bow my knee to him. I am not going to have table fellowship with him. We are not serving from the same understanding and assumptions. Daniel saying, I serve the God of Israel. You see, the Lord is greater than, uh, this, than the temple. He's greater than Jerusalem. He even rules here in Babylon. Well, you have then the steward who's you know, commanded by the chief eunuch to go and to make sure that these youths are plumped up and that they look uh, like they're worthy to be in the presence of the king. You don't want these scrawny, uh, starving-looking sort of prisoners in the king's presence. You you want that appearance of force, of health, of wealth, of these sorts of things. And so you you find that this king, on on the one hand, seems benevolent, and yes, a little controlling maybe. You know, he's trying to break these boys of their old identity. And you think maybe this king really is nice and benevolent, and he's not, not, not so bad. But now you have this statement from the steward that we understand that this king isn't so kind. Because he's saying, listen, you're you're putting my head in danger now. If I concede this will that you do not eat at the king's table and eat the king's food, well, the king has ways of persuading us to do what he desires. And if you go through Babylonian history, there are some pretty depraved ways in which people are executed, and we will find uh, some of those ways that the king tries to persuade these men uh, to bow their knee to him. But nevertheless, the steward understands God's, or his, his Lord, as he says it, because notice then that contrast. Daniel's conceding his God, God is my judge, and this steward is saying, but my Lord, the king, is the one who's going to be angry, and I, I, I don't know what's going to happen to me. I don't understand my fate, and my head is in danger. So in terms of this reality, Daniel says, listen, how about we do this? We do a test for 10 days. Now, 10 days, we think of 10 commandments, 10 plagues, a number of completion in scripture. And he's saying that after 10 days, you you survey us. We'll we'll just eat the vegetables. We we don't want to really dine with the king, but but we'll just eat vegetables. We'll sustain life. Compare us to the other youths that you've taken from other nations. See how we stack up. If if we're uh, scrawny looking and, and, and we don't look healthy, okay. Then, then we'll concede your will. But if, if we look healthy, how about you, uh, you care for us, you, you concede this, and, and we just go forward with this. So this seems acceptable to the steward, and this is what they do. And so you find that Daniel, at least one whose name means God is my judge, is one who truly is living up to this name. Now we find the operation behind the scenes. Because we can't just say it's about Daniel or about his goodness or what he's done. There's something bigger going on here. Because we still have that issue in verses 1 through 7. Is God sovereign outside of Jerusalem? Is God bigger than his temple? And so we find in verses 17 through 21 that we have these names that were given to these boys. 
we find that these names are not given. They're referred to as the four youths. That's Daniel. Uh, we, we don't have, again, in verse 19, uh, their new names that are given to them. They are those who maintain this identity. So you have God who truly preserves his people. He's giving the identity that he's given to them. He is not absent from them in the midst of this. Nebuchadnezzar can boast of whatever he wants. But the Lord is going to show the serpent seed that the serpent seed will never triumph over him. This is the assurance we take that there is nothing that can overpower our God no matter what we perceive our circumstances to be, no matter what lays before us. We can be confident that our God is faithful, that our God is sovereign, and that our God is very much present. And so we find this in terms of how the Lord is working. Because remember, the purpose of this is to indoctrinate these boys into the ways of the Chaldeans. He's trying to break them of their Hebrew ways. And so we think, oh my, there's, there's still sort of that unanswered tension. But we have this interjection by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in verse 17. A wonderful statement that God gave them learning. It's not their natural ability. It's not the eunuch who is skilled or the tutors uh, in this particular place or this foreign land. It's God who gave them wisdom and insight. That God is working through these four youths. He has not turned his back. He is still present with his people in this foreign land. And as the Lord is the one who gives them insight, we think about the name Nebuchadnezzar. What does that name mean? It means Nebo, protect the crown. So again, it's Nebuchadnezzar desiring a foreign god to protect his crown. So you have Nebuchadnezzar set up in the beginning of this, of this narrative as being this great king, the ruler over the world, the one who is mighty and all-powerful. Even Jeremiah concedes that. But we have then that challenge. Is Nebo bigger than the God of heaven? Well, the Lord is the one who's sustaining these boys. The Lord is the one who's giving them wisdom and insight. The Lord is going to use these men in this particular time. And the Lord is still with his individuals. This king will not be able to rip these children out of the hand of their God. What a wonderful comfort that is. As they serve their Lord in confidence of who God is, the Lord is there working, continuing to uphold his people. But we have also this reminder of how long Daniel is here. He's at wisdom. He's able to perceive these dreams. He's again noted ten times greater or ten times wiser or better than all the enchanters and all the wise men of Babylon, which is a very important thing to know as a book develops because Daniel will be called in and Daniel will reveal what the Lord is doing and Daniel will speak the truth in the Lord's timing, in the Lord's providence. And we find that as Daniel is here, he is one who is here until the arrival of King Cyrus. This tells us that Nebuchadnezzar, the great king, Nebo will protect. We find Nebo cannot protect because Cyrus is a king who comes and brings Israel back or Judah back to the promised land. In fact, even Isaiah in 44 verse 28 recounts Cyrus as the Lord's shepherd. Uh, he is the one who brings the Lord's people home. Isaiah 45, 1. Cyrus is a Lord's anointed to do the Lord's work. And so we have this reminder that while Nebuchadnezzar may think he's great, the Lord is the one who is sovereign over the world history, over the world itself. And he is guiding and he is shaping as it is called uh, to go and as he desires it to move. And so a rich comfort we take from this is the assurance that our Lord is the one who is more sovereign than the temple more sovereign than Jerusalem. We can face life circumstances, we can go through life's transitions, and we can wonder, is the Lord in the midst of us? What we find in Babylon, think about these individuals. Our king is apostate. We've been conquered. We're in a foreign land. We get a king who's a tyrant, who has no problem torturing people to persuade them or make an example of them. Where is God in the midst of us? Here we find in Daniel we find the answer to that. God is walking in the midst of his people, shepherding and guiding them. 
the call is for us to have confidence that the Lord is in the midst of these circumstances, that he is a faithful redeemer, a faithful God who redeems and calls his people. And so then we began with that question of which king is defeated. Which king is the true king? Well, hopefully we've already seen that Nebo cannot protect Nebuchadnezzar. We find that even the Jewish individuals are being ripped out of their Jewish identity, given foreign names, commemorating gods that sort of parallel their Hebrew names. The God of Israel knows them as his people. The true God rises above the false gods, even in a foreign land that we have the understanding even from Jeremiah that Nebuchadnezzar was raised up for a time to do the Lord's will, much like Pharaoh, that God is very much sovereign, working out his purpose in history. So the true king then, hopefully we understand, is our God, the one we serve, the one who has sent Christ, the one who has overcome death, the one who is a great shepherd who continues to lead and to guide us. It is this God we serve. It is this God to whom we are called to offer ourselves as living sacrifices, as our catechism puts it so well, out of gratitude, out of a joy of living for him, dying to self, recognizing that even as we may not see his hand leading us and shepherding us in the way we may desire him to lead and shepherd us, he is still leading and shepherding us through all the circumstances in times of our lives. Let us walk then in that confidence of who our God is as a faithful king, a faithful redeemer, a faithful shield and defender who lives up to his promise. Amen. Thank you for watching or listening to our podcast. Belgrade URC is a Bible-believing, reformed, confessional church that seeks to cultivate community around our Savior. If you desire to learn more about Christianity, please join us for worship each Sunday at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. If you're not able to attend church, you can tune in to our Sunday live stream through our YouTube channel. Please subscribe to our current sermon series and weekly meditation through iTunes or your favorite podcast catcher. If we are not listed on your favorite podcasting host, please let us know through our webpage u-r-c-b-e-l-g-r-a-d-e dot com. You can also utilize our archive sermon series on our website, urcbelgrade.com. Most of all, we hope to see you sojourning and fellowshipping with us each Sunday. Until we meet again, may the Lord's blessing and peace be upon you.